Well, so far in our initial look at the molecular part of genetics, we've talked about how did we discover DNA? At least DNA in the form of being our genetic material. And how do we make the decision that that was in fact, most likely the, the genetic material is being transmitted or inherited? Well, that took a number of individuals doing lots of different studies. We concentrated on three of those. Uh, there, again, there were many more than these, but the ones that are big for us were Griffith's experiment uh, back in the 1920s when he was looking at pneumonia and there's a virulent and avirulent form. And he was able to demonstrate that he could heat kill the virulent form, mix it with the uh, non-virulent form, and somehow that heat killed would take over, would transform this others. He didn't understand what the mechanism was or what was being transmitted to make this happen, but it took about 15 years before some new technology came along, some enzymes that could break apart RNA and DNA and other things. Avery McClarty McLeod used that to do a very beautiful classic science experiment where they tried to eliminate the things that couldn't be correct. So they eliminated RNA, you still got transformation, eliminated proteins, you still got transformation. Once they eliminated DNA, you no longer got transformation. Now it's still thought, well, maybe the DNA is just a, a vessel for these proteins. And once you break it apart, it doesn't work. And it wasn't until Hershey Chase's famous experiment in the early 1950s that showed, no, you can have transformation or you can have takeover and transmission from one generation to the next by just DNA. DNA has the code. So by the 1950s, DNA is generally accepted as the structures that we have. We know it's a genetic material, but we really don't know what it looks like. Okay. We have some ideas about the base structures, but we don't have, have a clue about how it's put together and formed. And it was worth a Nobel Prize to figure that out. So these are a couple of fairly short lectures uh, where I want to first look at the basic building blocks, the structures. And this is pretty much just to remind you of these structures. We're not going into great detail, certainly not in detail like you might in biochemistry about bond angles and all that. Simply going to remind you of some nomenclature and some parts. Once we've gone through a couple of lectures to get those pieces together, then we're going to actually build DNA and talk about the discovery of the final structure and then what it looks like, set up a model for that. So just to remind you where we are, uh, we've known since the 1800s about nuclein, uh, chromatin and mitosis were discovered and, and talked about and described in the 1800s. And then building all this by the late 1800s, Russell had discovered that there was nucleic acids could be broken down. And in fact, it was in the late 1800s that he described five bases that we now know are part of DNA. And it was worth a Nobel Prize that he, was, he won in, in 1910. Okay, shortly, uh, based on this information, uh, Levine had started to, to take RNA and pull it apart and understood some of the components. And he actually came up with a model that we'll talk about later about what DNA actually looked like. It took a couple of things for him to do. RNA was first, he worked on other things, and then he came back to DNA and figured out the components of that. And finally, Alexander Todd actually figured out late in the uh, 1940s how to synthesize nucleotides. So he could figure out what the base parts were and how they fit together. So both of these individuals, plus again, a number of other labs coming together, told us about the chemistry of DNA, helped us understand what was going on. So what makes up the parts? Well, I think we all know that there are three major parts of any piece of DNA. There is a nitrogenous base, which is either a pyrimidine or a purine. We'll explain no, more about that in a moment. There is a sugar. And in the case of RNA, it's a oxyribose, it's a ribose sugar. In DNA, it's a deoxyribose sugar. And then because we're talking about DNA, right, we're talking about a nucleic acid, deoxyribonucleic acid. It has to have an acid form, which makes it negative, which is the phosphoric acid which does a lot of important things as we see when we talked about the final structure. Okay. Now, all three of these components put together uh, are, known as a, are known as a nucleotide. <clears throat> when you, once you have all three elements together, um, if you're taking biochemistry or, or organic, you know that there's also nucleosides and these other components. But we're going to concentrate on building a nucleotide, the final product that we need. So let's start with the things we have. We have these nitrogenous bases, which form into two groups. One is a six-membered ring, okay? and these are the, the, the small 
part with the large name. So these are primidine. So these include cytosines and thymidine. Okay. And then there's a nine member ring. So these are the larger structures. And these are going to be your purines. Okay. And the two purines we have are adenine and guanine for our purposes. Okay. So these are the bases. All life on this planet is built from these four bases. Your, the sequence that they occur in our DNA drives everything. Okay. Now, <clears throat> these are the primitive rings are, as you can see here, are fairly straightforward. We're not again, not going to worry too much about the bonds or anything else, but they're cytosine and thymine. Now, to point out here that making a slight conversion, particularly from thymine over here to lose this, lose this group, we can, can produce uracil. And uracil then is a part of RNA, so it's unique to RNA. So you should be able to recognize these structures. Again, you're not going to have to draw them for this course, but you ought to know that this is, in fact, a primidine ring right here, and then it's thymine, okay, that's T, that this is uracil that's here. And these are going to be important later on because we talk about mutations and the molecular basis of mutations. When we knock off a methyl group or we add some other group, a bromide group, that's what's going to change these from one form to another. So they can, you can see they're very similar. They can move from one form to another by these mutational forms. And often that's what leads us to actually having point mutations that we're going to talk about. All right, the purine rings, again, are a double ring. Looks like this. Again, not going to spend a lot of time on them. Uh, but what's important for us are the way maybe they're numbered, which is starting out at, at Number one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven, eight, nine. Number nine here is going to be important for us on this particular one. All right. So that's really all that there is for this part. Uh, we're just looking at those forms. I should like for you to go and go in the book, make sure you recognize them all, spend a little time working on them. And in the next little short lecture, we're going to talk about how those nucleotides form up. How are we going to take all the components and actually put them together?